Hi, I'm Gretchen Rubin. I am an author and podcaster who explores happiness, good habits, and human nature. I'm the author of The Happiness Project and several other books, and I am also the co-host of the Happier with Gretchen Rubin podcast. It's a time of the year where a lot of people are thinking about habits. A lot of people are thinking about transformation. You hear a lot of like the phrase new year, new you. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm curious as someone who has written a lot about changing your life and starting new habits and, and kind of making these big projects. What's your feeling around that idea of like January is the time to do this stuff? So there really is no magic to January 1st. But at the same time, it is true that... Um, sometimes certain periods feel auspicious. And one of the things I like about the kind of new year, new you is since everyone is reflecting and everyone is setting aims and sort of everybody's talking about it, there's a little bit of momentum because it, it's sort of out there. So I think it can be very helpful. Um, but I think that if you miss January 1st, you shouldn't feel like, oh, well, you know, I missed my chance. Um, I have to wait till the next January 1st or even the next February 1st. There's no need to wait. Now is always the best time. You know, there's that old saying, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the second best time is now, and the best time to change and to start a healthy habit is now. I, I love your podcast. I, I also love listening to your sister on her own podcast and, and hearing the like overlap between those two. And it feels like you two really support each other in the changes that you make. How do you think about like working in habits with friends and family so that you're all supporting each other rather than I think we've all had the experience of like your family kind of undermines you by like doing the opposite of what you're trying to do. And you put your finger on a crucial point, which is that we really pick up habits from other people. And this can work for us. Like if one partner in a relationship quits smoking, the other person's more likely to quit smoking. But they can also work against us because, you know, when one person breaks a habit, they can often sort of the other person gets encouraged to go along with them. So it's really important to think about other people. And I do think it's really easy to sort of start thinking about ourselves in isolation and forget how much other people influence us. You have to like, look around the pe the people in your life and say, are these people like, in like helping me? Are they encouraging me? Are they making it easier for me to keep these good habits? Or are they not? And I think the sad truth, and, and I think we've all seen this, is sometimes people really don't want you to keep a good habit because maybe if you keep a good habit, then they feel guiltier about the fact that maybe they're not following that good habit. Or maybe they feel like, well, I can't do what I want if you're not going to come along with me. That's going to disrupt our usual plans. Or maybe it's just kind of inconvenient for me. Like, yeah, if you want to get up and go for a run in the morning, that means I'm going to have to play a bigger role in getting the kids to school. And I don't feel like doing that. And so I think we have to think about this. And if we're going to set ourselves up for success and think like, well, how are other people contributing to this? Or maybe how do I have to think about the fact that um, maybe they're not as enthusiastic as I would wish? But I would also say, I think sometimes people really want like, let's do it as a team or I really need you to cheer me along. And it's like maybe people aren't interested in doing that. So I wouldn't wait for other people to buy in or to... Uh, you know, be full of praise and encouragement. It's sort of like, I think a lot of times we just sort of have to figure out um, how to make our own way too. Do you make lists for yourself every year of like what you're trying to do? Or is it oh. something where, like, how do you think about <laughs> these well, things for yourself I mean, personally? You can't go by me because this is like my, this is my work <laughs> and my hobby. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So one thing I do every year is I make a, like a 23 and 23 list I'll do this year. I'm going to make a list of 23 things that I would really like to get done in 2023. So it's a list that goes through the whole year. Some of the things will be fun. Some of the things will be arduous. Maybe I have many things that I've put off year to year that I'm still working toward. I always put on a few things that I can do in like, 20 minutes to, you know, get a, get something crossed off the list. Every list should have at least one thing that you can cross off. Another thing we do is we will uh, pick a one word theme for the year. And that's also to kind of like energize a certain kind of attitude or um, a set of aims. I love that. I love the theme. Like I, I, the, just the idea of like, it doesn't have to be all goals. It can also be like, this is the kind of energy that I want to bring into the year. Exactly. And then you start seeing how when like things will fit into it, like, okay, my word was salt. And because I'm writing a book about the five senses and salt is so important. But salt, the more I thought about it, it had all these layers of meaning, preserving things. And I'm really interested in how we preserve memories, um, adding flavor and zest because salt is sort of a universal flavor enhancer. So how can you add that sort of zest? Um, too much 
is not good. You know, so oh. it's one of these things where like find the right amount of the things in my life, not too much, not too little. And it's it's necessary for life. You know, you have to have it. So so it had all these sort of metaphoric meanings and I found it to be very thought provoking as I was sort of going through all my aims. Um, another thing we do is we always pick a challenge, something to do for 23 and 23, or, you know, like we did um, walk 20 and 20 when we challenged ourselves and listeners to walk at least 20 minutes in 2020. And that's having fun with the year, the year, the 23-ness of it all. Um, so I do those as well as sort of the standard resolutions. One of the big things that I was noticing that I, I had done in the past is I would make these goals that were completely out of my ability to achieve. Like they in, relied on other people. So it was like Ooh. sell a TV show, right? It's like, yes. okay, well, th- there's a lot in that that relies on people that are not me. There's, there's at least dozens of people that have to say yes to something. And, and I started changing things based on hearing you talk about them so that now my goals are like, one, I always, I love the having an easy one on there, right? I'm like, mm-hmm. get into the ocean. <laughs> okay, great. I can do that. I can go yeah. jump into the ocean. Yeah. But then yeah. The, the other part is I started changing it so that it was more like at the end of the year, I could look back and say, like, did I do this, right? Like, did I write a new script? Fine. That is on me. I can do that. As opposed to, like, did I convince 17 people who I may never even meet in person that it was a great script? It's out of my control. You put your finger on something really important, which is that we it's, it's more helpful to focus on actions, not outcomes. Because you're right. We can't control outcomes. I want to sell a best-selling book. Well, that depends on other people, not me. But I could say, write for three hours every morning. Um, so I think, And I think you're right to say that it should be concrete, because I think even things like eat more healthfully or appreciate the moment. It's like at the end of the day or at the end of the year, it's like, did I do that? A really popular tool that a lot of people use is don't break the chain. And I think one of the reasons that it works is like to do a don't break the chain, you have to articulate something in a way that you can check it off every day. So it's not like learn Italian because you can't learn Italian today, but it's like learn five new Italian words, memorize them. It's Mm. like, I know if I did that, I can check it off. And so, and that, and then you can see yourself making progress. If you said something like every single day, do something that furthers the possibility that I sell a TV show. I could write, I could network, I could go to lunch, I could spend time researching like a company that I'm thinking maybe would be good to collaborate with, but I need to like poke around and see if I know anybody there. So you would be working towards that aim, but in a systematic, concrete, manageable way. And then you'd be tracking it. And sometimes even if you're not consciously trying to change, just monitor something like how much you spend or how many times a day you lose your temper just by keeping track of it we tend to start doing a better job awareness helps you to be more in line with what you would like to do I found that that happened when I started keeping just a very short journal. And now I, I now I got to have like a whole array of journals where I have like my daily like little one and then a longer one where I do thoughts. But when I first started just like writing, like, what did I do today? It all of a sudden changed where I was having more interesting days because otherwise I'd get to the end of the day and be like, well, I sat in front of the computer all day. I right, can't even yeah. fill the small paragraph. Right, like, right. I don't want that to be the feeling at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, that's different. another journal I have is the one sentence journal where you write just one sentence because a lot of people have the urge to keep a journal, but they kind of can't like, you know, they don't have very much time or energy. And mm. that's a perfect example of like just doing that in your one sentence journal. And that would actually would be fun to look back like in a year and say, what was I doing a year ago today? And it would just be this little thing. Sometimes people make these kind of observations of like, like you write in The Happiness Project that the days are long, but the years are short and, and that you felt like time was passing and you're not focusing enough on the things that really matter. Yeah. And I feel like that's the kind of observation that many of us have had some less articulate version of like sure. failing in our life. But most of us just say that. You really have like, tra- you transformed your whole life. You went from being a, a lawyer clerking in the Supreme Court to being a writer, which is a, a real transformation and a scary one because you leave from this like certain kind of reliable income. It's a very clear career path to something that's much more uncertain. And I know you've talked a lot about habits and how other people can do it, but as you continue to think about like building your own life and evaluating it and, and thinking like, is this what I want to be? How do you check in on that for yourself? And how do you make sure that it is like what you're looking for and then change it if it's not? I think that's a great question because I think sort of self-reflection and self-knowledge is so key. And you think, well, I just hang out with myself all day long. So like, what could be more obvious? But it is it is really hard sometimes to know what we want. I do a lot of different things now. I love it because it gives me all these ways to engage with people about ideas, which is my favorite thing to do. But at my heart, I'm a writer. And I always say to myself, you know, I would do this for free. I would do this if no one read it. This is for me. This is what I love. I feel like I almost don't even have a choice. 
Um, mm. I feel compelled to do it. When I have that feeling of like, oh, I, I can't wait to get up out of bed on a Sunday morning and like run to my desk because I have like, I'm working on my aphorisms project. Like that's how I know that I'm doing the right thing for me because I just, I have that feeling of like, I can't not do it. Um, so I mm. feel so fortunate that I'm in a place where I can do what I really love to do. And in a way that like, you know, is connecting with an audience because I would still do it if no one read it, but it's a lot yeah. more fun when people read it. That <laughs> yeah, is yeah, for yeah. sure. I had a, a, a moment where I was working as a fifth grade teacher. It was really rewarding, but it was super intense. I was working very long hours. I wasn't getting a lot of time to sleep and I was still finding time to go out and perform comedy. And I had the similar thing of like, well, I'm going to do this anyway, because it doesn't make yes. any sense for me to be yes. doing this now. And yes. yet I'll still do it. But I think sometimes yes. people misinterpret that idea to mean that it's always fun or that you always feel confident about it. And often for me, doing comedy, writing, like yes. they're excruciating. And yet yes. I never doubt that I would do this anyway, even yes. though it's not always fun at all. That is such a paradox that, that, that when I was starting to think about happiness, when I was writing The Happiness Project, that was something that was very hard for me to untangle. Like, how do you think about that? And the way I figured it out for myself was to say, well, two things. One is happiness doesn't always make you feel happy. Like if we were scientists talking about happiness, we would have to like use an official term and really define it. But as com common lay people, doing what makes you happy doesn't always make you feel happy. And what I realized is that you can think about happiness in, like as in four parts. There's feeling good, feeling bad, feeling right in an atmosphere of growth. So feeling good is like love, enthusiasm, friendship, all the things that make mm -hmm. you feel good. And then there's feeling bad. So you're like, I, are there ways for me to l eliminate anger, resentment, boredom? Uh, indignation, like how can I bring those down? Guilt. And then there's feeling right, which is, you know, we're happier when our, our life reflects our values. So am I putting my values into the world? Am I living the life that I feel like I want to live and that is right for me? And then an atmosphere of growth is feeling like, am I growing? Am I learning? Or am I teaching? Or am I helping, you know, others? Am I, is, do I have that feeling of growth? So doing stand up, you could see like, well, it kind of makes you feel bad. There's maybe <laughs> yes, fleeting often. moments of feeling good, but there's a lot of like anxiety, insecurity, you know, all that. Um, but it makes you feel right because you're like, this is the kind of person that I want to be. This is the kind of occupation I want to be doing. And then there's that atmosphere of growth, which I'm sure you were like, each time you did one, you were like, whew, I did one more. I learned this. Yeah. I got this done. You know, you have to fail a lot and stand up be to succeed. Sometimes people say to me like, that by t saying that people should be happier, I'm saying that they're going to be like skipping for joy 24 hours of the day, every day of the week. I'm like, that's not realistic. And it's not even a good life. It's something to th it's something to think about and work towards, but it's not going to look like that every single minute. There are many times where we wouldn't even want or expect to feel happy. It wouldn't be appropriate. But we can yeah, try to be as happy as we can be under the circumstances. You write this in Happier. You, you say, like, there's no magic one-size-fits-all solution for building a happier, healthier, more creative, and more productive life. But there are some elements that stand out. And, and you know, you just listed a ton of those elements. But I think that is key. Like, it's not going to look the same for everyone. It's not going to feel the same. But there are things we can do that will bring us onto that? Well, one thing, I mean, is relationships. I mean, if you were going to say, well, what is the key? Like, what is, what's true for everyone? We are social creatures to be happy. We have to have enduring intimate relationships. And, you know, uh, I feel like we can confide, we can give and get support. And so if you're thinking about how to spend your precious time, energy, or money, um, thinking about how to deepen relationships or broaden relationships is something that's, that like, yeah, one size does not fit all. I dare say many people would not think that doing stand up would be, you know, oh. a, a, a route to happiness for them. But um, but for just about everyone, um, relationships, however that might look for the individual, is a key to happiness. Especially since we're at this time of year where people are thinking a lot about like habits. It, it does seem like another key to happiness is the idea of doing something repeatedly, right? Like if you want to write a book, if you just write one page every day at the end of a year, You've yeah. written a lot of a book, maybe a whole book. Yes. So if, if forming good habits can make us happier, can breaking bad habits have that same effect too? Like, is that just as important as starting a, a good habit? Absolutely. And really good habits and bad habits, they're usually just framing of the same thing. So it's like, you know, uh, not staying up too late is really get it, you know, going to bed on time. So I think a lot of times you can think about it either way and, and different things appeal to different people. So you could, you know, quit sugar or you could eat more healthfully. One thing that has surprised me is how much vocabulary matters to people, how much framing matters. You might say like, 
A name is a name. A habit is a habit. But it turns out that it, it like, are you playing piano or practicing piano? You know, mm. uh, it, it, it matters to people. Um, but as you say, about 40% of everyday life is shaped by habits. They're like the invisible architecture of everyday life. And so, yeah, if we have habits that work for us, it's just going to be a lot easier um, to have a happier life. So much of, of your book, Better Than Before, is about breaking these bad habits, right? Like the, the full title is Better Than Before, what I learned about making and breaking habits to sleep more, quit sugar, procrastinate yeah. less, and generally build a happier life. And yeah. honestly, those are four things that probably many people out there would yeah. love to have accomplished in this new year. So <laughs> how do you go about setting manageable goals and, and break up those kind of tasks into smaller steps? Like how do you, if you're, if you think that that's what you want, but you're not quite sure where to go. And obviously one answer could be, you should buy that book and read it all. But uh, before they do that, what's, what's a step for them? Well, one thing is to conceive of it in a, in a way that it is a habit, that it's not a goal. What would you do that would get you where you want to go? Um, but that would uh, be something that could be a habit that you could do uh, day after day. And really the thing about habits is part of what makes them effective is that they reduce decision making. So I'm not deciding whether or not to wear my seatbelt because every time we make a decision, we can decide wrongly. You know, we want to make it just, it just happens automatically. Now, some habits are more complicated and they're more complex and they have to be worked into our schedule more so they aren't as easy as something like brushing your teeth or wearing your seatbelt, which are very quick and can be, you know, very, very automatic. But there's a lot of ways that we can, you know, find, well, what is the behavior and how can I think about that automatic quality that will um, help us to stay on track over the long term? I had not thought about this as a habit before, but it's often so hard to find time to spend time with good friends, even ones who I really love. Yeah. And I have a few friends where we just have a time on the calendar where it's like, hey, every Tuesday we have a quick call or, hey, we meet up and take a walk on Fridays. And those people, I find that I see so much more and we're so much closer because there's never, it takes the decision to not do it rather than to do it. And yeah. I had never thought about that as a habit, but I guess you can have like a two person or a group habit too. Absolutely. And I like for that reason, I'm a big fan of groups of joining or starting groups because you just have a set time to meet and you're not making a lot of one, one off plans. If you're in a group, if you miss one time, well, then you can catch everybody the next time. You sort of see a bunch of people at once. So it's more efficient. It's kind of funny to talk about efficiency and friendship. One of the problems with friendship is it takes time and energy. And a lot of people don't have that much time and energy. And one of the things that's nice about a group, too, is like, if we were in a group and you brought a couple friends and I brought a couple friends, well, now I'm meeting your friends and I and you're meeting my friends and now we're creating a social network. And that's like a very easy and kind of effortless way to expand your social circle, but in a way that's like like building on what you already have. And also, you know, with with relationships, I think frequency is more important than duration. So it's more important to do a quick check in with somebody um, or like see them for a day than it is to be like, well, we need to go away for like a whole week and hang out or like I need to be able to talk to you for three hours or it's not even worth getting on the phone. It's like, yeah, you can, there's a lot of value in quick check-ins. Talking about the, the types of people and how certain people react better to like having a thing on the calendar and other people push back against that. I know this is a thing you've thought a lot about, right? You have the, the four tendencies, which you've yes. written about. You have, you even have a quiz on your website where people can figure yeah. out what tendency they are. Yes. Um, can you just run us quickly through like the four tendencies and, and how they relate to this? So the four tendencies is a personality framework that I came up with to explain a lot of patterns that I saw in habits, like how people could and could not successfully use certain approaches to like make or break their habits. The four tendencies looks at something that sounds very boring, but ends up being really juicy, which is expectations. So my framework divides people into four categories, upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. And like you say, you can go to quiz.gretchenrubin.com and take the quiz. But most people know what they are just from a brief description. We all face two kinds of expectations, outer expectations like a work deadline and inner expectations like I wanna keep a New Year's resolution. So depending on whether we meet or resist outer and inner expectations, that's what makes us an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, a rebel. So an upholder readily meets outer and inner expectations. They meet the work deadline, they keep the New Year's resolution, without much fuss. They, they want to know what other people expect from them, but their expectations for themselves are just as important. So their motto is discipline is my freedom. 
Then there are questioners. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do it if they think it makes sense. So they're making everything an inner expectation. If it meets their inner standard, they will do it no problem. If it fails their inner standard, they will push back. And they are the people that don't like things that are arbitrary, mm. they're, that are ineffective, unjustified. They love customization. They love reasons. So their motto is, I'll comply if you convince me why. Then there are obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. So these are the people who say, why can I keep my promises to other people, but I can't keep my promises to myself? And the, the lesson for obligers is that they need outer accountability, even to meet an inner expectation. If they want to read a book, join a book group. If they want to exercise, they need to take a class or work out with a trainer or take their dog for a run or think of their duty as a role model. There's a lot of ways to create outer accountability, but that's what you need. They're really great at showing up for other people, but they need outer accountability to do it for themselves. So their motto is, you can count on me and I'm counting on you to count on me. And then the last category is rebel. Rebels resist all expectations, outer and inner alike. They wanna do what they wanna do in their own way, in their own time. Um, they can do anything they wanna do, anything they choose to do. But if someone else asks or tells them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And typically they don't tell themselves what to do. Like they don't make a plan to see a friend every Tuesday at 7 p.m. because they think, well, I don't know what I'm gonna feel like doing Tuesday at 7 p.m. And just the idea that it's on my calendar is gonna annoy me. So their motto is, you can't make me and neither can I. <laughs> so those are the four. So I am 100%, uh, I am an obliger like to the core. I am so good. If, if I have a boss and the boss wants something, oh, you are gonna get that thing. And yet most of my life I am self-employed and boy, do things go from one to-do list to the next to-do list to the next. And I always think like, if there was just another person named Chris who was the head of Chris Enterprises, we would be done with all these things. We would have been done with them years ago. Thinking about how do you get some external accountability for the internal desires has been helpful for me in that, you know, maybe I make like a, a join a writer's group and then like I have to send my script in. Maybe it's like I have a person where we're working out together so that I just know like I, I'm not going to let them down. Those are those pieces have really helped me to, to get it um, to the next step. And uh, for you, what which one are you? So I'm in a polder. I'm the first one. As an obliger, you are in the biggest category. For both mm. men and women, that's the one that the most people belong to, the biggest number of people belong to. For a lot of obligers, it, they sort of feel like they shouldn't need accountability. And you know why? It's because of polders, questioners, and rebels are like, you don't need accountability. You know, do it for yourself. Get clear on your why. Like, you know, if, if it's important to you, you'll make time. It's like, no, they need it. Obligers need it outer accountability. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, and clearly so many people thrive because there's so many tools to help people get at our accountability because for so many people it's vital. Um, and so I think for an obliger, sometimes it's a relief to realize like, oh, this is just a thing. A lot of people are in the same boat. I just like get myself that out of accountability. There's sometimes people treat it like it's training wheels that you should aim to get rid of. And I'm mm. like, no, it's not. If you need outer accountability, like you're in great company, you know? It is It is hard sometimes though to not feel like, oh, upholders are the good one. You wanna be the good one. You're not, the, you're like the bad, the, you're the less good than the good one, you know? But what you see is that all, it, that there is no best one. They all have strengths and weaknesses. And mm -hmm. like the strengths are the weaknesses. Like as an upholder, I'm really good at executing, but I'm also rigid, right? Mm -hmm. Because once I have that plan, it's like, it's really hard for me to change. What you see is the people who are the, the happiest, the healthiest, the most productive, the most creative are the people who have like figured themselves out and they get themselves what they need to thrive. And they're like, if I need accountability, I'm gonna find a way to get, like if I need to get that writing done, I'm gonna join that group. I'm gonna have my agent say, hey, send me a chapter once a month. But like in a workplace, you'd sort of like, sometimes like your boss will sort of not be realizing that what works for the boss doesn't work for all the team or different team members are kind of working at cross purposes. That's why I think it's good to realize like, just because you don't need something or because you do need something doesn't necessarily mean that that's the key thing for someone else. I'm curious, you know, obviously we don't know each other, but you seem like you have it very figured out. Are there things where you're still like, man, I just, I am struggling with this and I, I can't quite figure out how to like make this 
work for myself. Sometimes I've just sort of decided like, well, that's not me, you know, and like, mm. I'm just not going to worry about that. So I think there are things where people might be like, hey, Gretchen, I think you should do a little work on that. And like meditation, right? I've tried meditation a couple times. So many people will say to you, like, meditation is like this crucial habit. Anybody who's trying to get happier, healthier, more serene, more creative should like focus on meditation. I gave it two tries. I threw all my ammunition at it to like, you know, solidify it. And I did it for months. And it was just like, this isn't working for me. So I stopped and I have many friends who are just the, my, my college roommate meditates like three hours a day and more if she can. So I have all these people in my life who really are advocating for how great it can be. And yet I just sort of decided like, yeah, it's not for me. And so and I don't even try. Yeah, it seems like that that might be one of the crucial parts of of having a, a satisfied or happy life is to like use the tools you have. And then when something's not working to be like. Hey, it's okay. Like, I don't need to fit someone else's definition of what I'm supposed to look like. Oh, a hundred percent. And I think people really do have an idea, like just take morning people and night people, you know, they have an idea like, oh, all the most creative, successful people get up early and like tackle the toughest part of their day, or that's when the best time to exercise, or that's when you should be writing your novel in your free time or something. But like 30% of the population is night people mm. who are really at their most productive and creative and energetic later in the day. And then some people are kind of in the middle, but I think people will say, will say like, well, you know, if you can't just get up early and do this, you just have to try harder. You just have to like, just double down instead of saying, hey, you know what? I'm really at my most creative at 7 p.m. Let me organize my life so I work from 7 to 9 p.m. Well, with that idea of like dropping things when they're not working for you. Yeah. You you coined this term for one day of the year, determination day. Yes. Which is that like many people have abandoned whatever their New Year's resolutions were by yes. February 28th. Yes. And that a, a yes. day, that's a day that other people could have called something like discouragement day, but you call yes. it determination day. Yes. And then they start accumulating, well, I've been so good, I should deserve some time off, or things come up and you find it hard to get back, uh, back in the saddle. And so I think it's good to have a day just like it's good to have a day of January 1st where we stop and reflect and think about, well, what do I want my life to look like and what changes could I make to, to, to help that to come to pass? Determination day is a day to say, like, hang on, what's working, what's not working? If something isn't working, maybe you keep the same aim, but you try it a different way. So, like, let's say you're an obliger and uh, you wanted to get more writing done, so you join this writing group. But by determination day, you're like, you know what? The thing about this group is like a lot of the people, they're not committed. They're not showing up having done any writing. Some people are like not showing up at all. So then I kind of feel like I'm off the hook. Mm. And so even though I, I want them to make me feel like I have to work, they're giving me excuses. Um, this isn't working for me. I still have the same aim. I want to get more writing done. But now I'm like, okay, this is not working as a tool. Let me try something else. Maybe I need to do something even as simple as doing it at a different time of day. Um, maybe I need to make something more convenient. Can I change some of the things around the habit that would make it more likely that I would do it? And determination day is a great day to sort of stop, reflect, evaluate, and and then uh, pivot um, if 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 you feel like that's what you need. This is a question that I I want to talk to you about. I, I'm. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to articulate it exactly right, but there's an there's an idea that I've heard people talk about in relationships. That's any long lasting marriage or or you know long term relationship isn't just between two people. It's between many different versions of each of those people because you're not the same person you were when you started, and neither is your partner. And so your marriage or your relationship has to change with you because. These people are not the same as, you know, my wife and I started dating when we were 19. We're, we're very different people than when we were 19. And for myself, aside from the relationship piece, I, over the past three years with the pandemic, with everything that's gone on in the world, I have this real sense that I am a different person than I was four years ago. That Ooh, interesting. I'm figuring out who I am. And, and part wow. of that is like this self-knowledge that a lot of the things we've been talking about, right? Like I work better at 7 a.m. I, I do this. A lot of those things for me right now feel like, oh, well, that was true of 2016, Chris. But now the person that I am in 2023, maybe that's not true anymore. Like I, I used to love being out late at night. I used to love like going and traveling and touring and Maybe those things don't work quite as well for me because that's not the person I am anymore. So I'm wondering, one, if that resonates at all for you, and and two, what you think about that idea of like, we're not the same people, 
and how do we find new systems for ourselves as we change? Well, I think that's a very profound point. And I think one of the things that can be hard about it is sometimes there can be kind of a sadness to saying, you know, that just isn't me. And it just is mm -hmm. never going to be me. Like, I'm going to let go of a fantasy self. Um, oh, I, you know, I'm going to be the kind of person who's going to play guitar. Maybe at mm -hmm. some point you're sort of like, it doesn't seem like I am going to be. I always think like, I want to be the kind of person that goes to a jazz club at midnight. And I'm like, that is so not me. Like, that's a fantasy self. Um, to let go of that. Or as you're saying, like sometimes like over time, things change. And so you have to let go of these previous identities. One place, because I wrote a little book called Outer Order, Inner Calm. And one place this shows up a lot, as you say, it can show up in habits. Like I have a habit that worked, but now it doesn't work for me. But it can even show up in stuff. Like hmm. I have a friend who had like, I don't even know, like nine tennis rackets or 11 tennis rackets. And it's because she played tennis in college. She was really good. And just to have like the one or two tennis rackets was like admitting that that period of her life and kind of that level of excellence was gone. And so it was very hard for her. And I think sometimes it is hard for people to let go of things that represent a past self. It's like constant self, sort of self-evaluation and self-recognition. Uh, and, I, and I think it's, it sometimes can be, can be, it can be difficult and it can even be painful. I'm curious to hear, right, that there's the, the Gretchen who wrote the Happiness Project, that was a version of yourself. It came out in 2009, so you were writing it before then. How is that Gretchen different than the Gretchen who we're talking to right now? Mm. In many ways, I'm the same. But so here's what I would say, like, because people are always like, oh, you wrote The Happiness Project. Are you happier? And I would say, like, I'm basically the same person. Like, if I take one of those one to ten things, I'm like a seven. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I think that's right. Like, I'm, you know, I'm pretty happy. And, and that's where a lot of people are. They're pretty happy. But what I think having written The Happiness Project and then like happier at home and better than before, and then my next book is about the five senses, I'm just met much better at setting up my day like, and making decisions that are going to contribute to my happiness. Because I mm -hmm. now have all these like, if I think, oh, gosh, my college reunion, I mean, I have to spend money, I have to get a hotel room, it's going to be logistics, blah, 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 I don't know who else is going, I'm going to have to send emails, maybe I should just skip it. Now, I like, I go through my happiness thing, and I'm like, it's deepening relationships and broadening relationships, and these are long-term relationships, they're, they're irreplaceable relationships, should I do it? And I'm like, yes, I should. Because in the long run, that's something that's going to make me happier. So I think I'm better at making decisions um, and, and, and sort of saying like, well, you know what, this is something that's really important to me, or maybe something is less important to me now than it used to be, and I'm going to let it go. So, so I think that's what's changed is I'm just much better at thinking about what matters to me um, and, how to, and how to put that into operation. I love that. And I guess the other thing is, do you ever feel boxed in by being like, but people expect me to be happy. Now I'm so sad. <laughs> Maybe I should feel more pressure to like live up to a reputation, but I absolutely do not. Um, no, I, I don't, I don't feel um, an, an, an obligation to sort of, uh, you know, constantly be putting a happy face on it. No, I don't. For listeners who are, are trying to think about like, okay, I'm going to put all these things that we've talked about into play. I'm going to come up with my list of things that I'm going to do, and I'm going to have my one word and all of those pieces. What are some obstacles or mistakes that commonly happen that they should avoid as they're, as they're thinking about what to start? A big mistake is thinking like, if it works for someone else, it'll work for me. I think that's the biggest source of frustration for people. Um, another thing I would say is like back to this idea of convenience, really make things as convenient as they can be or inconvenient. So like if you want to make, let's say you want to watch less TV, you know, put the remote control in some high shelf uh, in another room. So you can't just like wander by and be like, oh, let me just, you know, I just want to watch 10 minutes. It's like, yeah, that's two hours go by or make things convenient. Like I've heard of people like sleeping in their gym clothes so they didn't have to, you know, get dressed in the morning. A mistake I think is that sometimes people, um, make it too easy to do the thing they don't want to do and too hard to do the thing they do want to do. You know, if you want to practice violin, like, don't put that thing away. Like, you know, make it really inconvenient. Leave it out in the middle of the room where you're like tripping over it. Yeah, it's interesting, too, with the, the easier uh, making things more convenient or less convenient. One thing I was trying to do personally was not take the car everywhere. And instead, I have a bike. It's, if yeah. it's nice outside. Why not ride my bike? And the bike was locked up somewhere very safe around the corner, locked to a fence. But it took like, you know, two minutes to undo the lock to bring it up to the outside. And I was like, I'm never riding the bike. And then I just said, 
I would rather have a slightly higher chance of my bike being stolen, but actually ride the bike than a zero chance of being stolen and never ride my bike. So I put it right by the front, right by the front where I walk past out past it every day. And it becomes just as easy as the car. And then all of a sudden I'm riding my bike so many more places because it's there and I don't have to like, oh, I got to go behind and undo and everything like that. But that's a perfect example because you're like, what's two minutes? And you're like, that two minutes is the difference between doing it and not doing it. And I think it's great to say, like, it's better to do it and then, like, deal with it than to just never do it. Because the bike you never ride is the same as the bike that's stolen because it's a bike that you're not riding. Um, Another thing kind of along the same lines, making it more convenient is making it more pleasant. And something that works for a lot of people is pairing. The strategy of pairing is when you take something that you really want yourself to do or that you have to get yourself to do and you pair it with something that you really enjoy doing or that you really want to do. So a great example is like, let's say you have a favorite podcast, like your podcast or my podcast. You say, I can only listen to this podcast if I'm out for my daily walk. I can't listen to it in the car. I can't listen to it while I'm brushing my teeth. I have to be out on my walk. So pairing is something that can often, like, it's a kind of convenience because it's it's making something more pleasant and kind of something that is is less friction. Yeah, listen, if you pair, if you're listening out there and you pair listening to this podcast with taking your favorite walk, there's a strong chance that I will just call you and be like, you better take those walks. We need, right. <laughs> the numbers yes. have dropped. You got to get walking again. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it just makes it more fun and then uh, and then you're excited to do it. Gretchen, it, it's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for making the time to be on the show. Oh, thank you so much. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it tremendously.